I'm Simon McBurney, and I created and directed and I perform The Encounter. So quite early on in the show, Simon invites the audience to put on a pair of headphones. And this is sort of creates quite an unusual relationship between Simon and the audience. <laughs> Simon is describing something on stage. She's describing the jungle. He's making the sounds of the jungle. We feel the heat of the jungle through the audio. We use a binaural head, which is a little bit 3D sound. And because the head is right there on stage, you feel too, in a strange way, that you're on stage. And as the Amazon begins to assemble itself around you, people have a physical, palpable sense of being in another place, yet being where they are. Our hearing is one of these senses that's a bit unlike the sort of our, our visual sense in that we're always listening to it, even subconsciously. So it has a slightly different relationship to how we perceive the world to our visual sense. You realise that actually everyone is in total silence, total immersion, and they're very together. It feels like one body. You've been on this journey and you felt like you were alone, but then you realise that actually you were all in it together. It is a story also of listening and understanding that perhaps you are not alone. And this thing that we call solitude is also perhaps only a story that we in the Western world tell ourselves. Welcome to Build. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Well, thank you for creating this incredible piece of theater. I don't think I've ever had so much to say and felt so utterly speechless after seeing a work of theater as I, as I am after seeing The Encounter. I've seen it twice now, and both times I'm left feeling more connected to the world, uh, more inspired as an artist, and, mo and more excited to come back and see it again. Well, I don't know what to say to that. That's, uh, that's exactly what I would uh, hope that people would feel when they come to the show. Can you talk about the... Geez, there, it's like hard to even know where to start. Let's start with the actual story that you're telling. Okay. This is a one-man show in a way, in that you're the only human being that we see on the stage, but through the power of sound, you create a whole bunch of different characters, um, some of which you perform through your own voice and others who are recorded and played. I should say it's very important that everyone know that Every member of the Broadway audience wears a set of headphones, which allows the sound to kind of be the leading character. They're good headphones. They are good headphones, but you're telling the story of a man named Lauren McIntyre. Yeah, he, in 1969, um, he was a photographer for the National Geographic, and he was obsessed with finding the source of the Amazon. Geographic, as a kind of trade-off, because they thought that's not very photogenic, said, look, uh, there are these people called the Mayaruna people, who we thought no longer existed, but they're coming out of the forest. We want photographs of them. So uh, if you can get photographs of these people, uh, then we'll fund your expedition up into the Peruvian Andes. So he was dropped in alone, and he made contact. Um, and he started to get photographs and then he followed these guys into the forest and then he discovered that uh, he couldn't get back because he had no way of communicating. So the piece is about, the story is about McIntyre and his ability to communicate with these people and then at a certain moment what happens is that his camera gets ripped apart. Mm -hmm. So his whole reason for being there suddenly disappears. And at that point, he has to be exactly like these people. So in other words, his whole point of view on the world, how he thinks, what he thinks the world consists of, the reality of the world, has to change. And the consequence of this is that he's changed forever. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's what the, uh, the center of the piece is, exactly what you just said when you came and sat down, which is, uh, the question of how do we see the world here in the West? What do, we, what do we actually think is going on around us? 
because we are so uh, sure that we know what the reality mm -hmm. of this world is. We know there are things that we take to be real, like, for example, we're taking to be real the fact that this is uh, Friday and it's about uh, 10 past 12, uh, but those are, those are just fictions. They're just stories. They're just, they don't exist outside our common imagination. AOL, it doesn't exist. <laughs> it's just something that we have made up and we've decided that it's real. Um, and so, uh, but we don't question those things. And in a sense, what happens when you come and see this show is that I try to plunge you into a situation uh, which is not drug-induced, but it takes you maybe close to that kind of hallucinogenic feeling when you're losing your grip on what you think is normal reality and you begin to think of the world in a slightly different way. I think that's a perfect way to describe it. Your use of these headphones and what's called binaural technology, am I pronouncing that correctly? Correct. Which, it, it has the ability to, even though we're all strapping on these headphones, somehow make it feel like you're not standing in front of us on a stage, but you're actually inside our heads, which allows the audience, each audience member to become you and like experience your perspective and to become the characters well, as they make their quote unquote appearances in the story. That's right, it, it actually places the audience on stage so that when there are binaural recordings of the Amazon and all of you here in Mosquito, you literally hear it. Uh, I know you say, but yeah, but I could, I could hear that in a, a soundtrack of a, a piece of music I've got. But no, it's literally, it passes by your ear. And so what happens in the audience is, very often I'm looking out, people are kind of going like this every now and then, because it is so real that they're absolutely convinced that there is a mosquito or that there's a door opening. People start to look behind them. It's all about this head. You can see uh, yeah. in front of Simon in the picture on the poster, there's this futuristic looking sort of head shaped, that's actually a microphone. Can you explain how that works? It imitates the human head completely. So it has the same form, the same density. When we're speaking to each other in the world, the sound waves hit our head. They go round and into the ear, yes, but they also go through the head because you have you, your little kind of personal microphones, the stirrups and bones in your, in your ear, which then amplify the sound and mean that you can actually hear. Well, in that head, a tiny, very sensitive microphone, so the thing is worth about $30,000, uh, they're right in the center of the head, and they imitate exactly how we hear. So if you plug in with headphones, suddenly, wherever that head is, that is where you are. So for example, we not only took that to the Amazon jungle, so you can hear the sounds of the jungle, but it's in various different places in the show. You are in the Amazon rainforest, you're also on stage mm -hmm. with me. You're literally on stage on Broadway, so you, you feel like you're there. Because you're and narrating you're it from the point of view of yourself standing right. there telling a story. That's right. And um, you're in my home, my apartment. That's another piece of the story. Right? You have a, a daughter who's actually in the audience today who plays a part through her voice on the stage as well. That's right. Because the whole piece is... In an act of storytelling. Mm -hmm. So it's the oldest form. Right, well that's, so this whole piece seems to me as a study in contrasts. You have storytelling, which is the oldest art form in the world, and yeah. you have this crazy, fancy $30,000 head-shaped microphone, which is the cutting edge of modern technology. Um, and you've actually taken that to the rainforest to record sound, but you create a lot of sound through Foley artistry, which is like the kind of sounds they used to use in old-timey radio plays, where you'll use uh, old VHS videotapes or the crinkling of a paper bag That's right. um, to create sounds that then seamlessly get integrated into the soundscape you've created. I'm well, most of it is created live by me, almost like a, a piece of music. So I've got looping pedals under my desk, so if I wish to create an obsessive thought, I just press the looping pedal and then you hear McIntyre as he's getting kind of more and more concerned about certain things and ideas are obsessing in his mind. Uh, and so the, the thoughts go round and round and round and round. Um, um, uh, 
but at the same time, uh, um, you, you, you know, and, and then as, as you say, I've got a water bottle which then becomes the river. I have a, a, a packet of crisps which becomes a, uh, a fire. A, a fire. Um, but as well as telling the story, which is almost like a kind of once upon a time story, so that I lead people into this, you know, when we're told a story when we're a kid, we get so um, deep into it with our imaginations that we imagine ourselves really to be in it. And that's the effect that I want uh, in the audience. I literally begin to tell it step by step, but then gradually what happens is I fall into the character of McIntyre, I become him. So the audience, if you like, goes on a journey where they become more and more immersed to the point where McIntyre, of course, his vision of reality is utterly changed. He's suddenly taking hallucinogenic drugs and in a sense, his whole understanding of what the world is, um, you know, utterly shifts. Um, so yeah, exactly as you say, it's the oldest form with the most modern ideas. But at the same time as that, I'm questioning things about the story from my own point of view. So um, I am, I ask, I, I present myself as the storyteller. And as me, Simon McBurney, I had a lot of questions about the story. Did it actually happen? Right. Did he communicate telepathically with these people? Which is part of the story. Um, uh, and when I'm making a piece of work, I obsess about it. Like a lot of people, I stay up very late at night. Uh, and when I'm alone with my daughter, and she and I are alone in the house together, she always gets up. She likes to get up. She doesn't like to feel alone. So she keeps on getting up for about a couple of hours, which is about an hour and 45 minutes, which is the length of the show. So she keeps on getting up and interrupting me in the show, asking always the most pertinent questions. So uh, it sounds as if that would interrupt the story. But interestingly, what happens is it seems to intensify the story. And why is she there? Why do I have that? What's the point of that? This, it, it, you know, this second story, which is wound round like a piece of DNA. Well, the point about it is what the story is, is, is about, which is what's happening to us as a people. Are we thinking about the world in the most constructive way? These people in the Amazon forest understand that if we are not taking care of our world, if we are not intimately connected with it, the same way as we're intim intimately connected with ourselves and what's going on inside our heads, then what kind of future do we have? For me, my future is now very urgent because of my children. And in a sense, having my daughter there alerts the audience to the feeling of fragility and vulnerability that the world we're creating is extremely worrying. We are destroying, 2016 is the hottest year on record. There is an entirely, uh, uh, there's, there's a whole environmental part of the show, which is this question, what are we doing to the planet? What is happening here? Um, uh, which is absolutely critical because we are in a very dangerous moment. You hear my cousin, who's an oceanographer, he's an expert on the, on the temperature of the oceans during it, who says, look, uh, we're all part of nature and we can't escape it just as we can't escape the planet. But we spend most of our time thinking, no, we're not, we're not part of nature, we're in the AOL building, you know, and I'll go and st to nature at another point. I'll go and see the cows. No, we are always part of nature. We're affecting it. We're interacting it. And if you like, uh, we see that all over the world now, people are gradually beginning to wake up. But we've got to wake up faster than that. And this process of becoming aware of that, of course, is one part of this show. I mean, we see that now. There are people who are being active. Uh, the North Dakota Access Pipeline, people are protesting now. People say, well, what are you doing? We need the oil. Well, the question is, do we need the oil? We can't always have oil all for, throughout history. This is crazy because of the amount of carbon dioxide that's going in the air. We cannot rely on fossil fuels. We've got to have other things. We've got wind. We've got water. And that is the point of the North Dakota Access Pipeline protest. Uh, this is urgent. We have to listen to each other. So if you like... 
coming back to the show... Well, we have to listen to each other. It's certainly the exactly. point of the show. Exactly. You've got headphones on, so you are listening. But also the meaning of the show is we have to listen to each other. Everybody has a different point of view. I mean, you've got, a, you, you've got an election in this country where it's so divided because people aren't listening to each other. You know, uh, 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 this is a critical thing, is that we got very much sort of alone in our own little bubble inside our heads. And that is the point of the show, is to really take you inside that bubble and say, what can you hear? One thing that I've learned about you in my... It's a bit of a rant. Well, I, I love it. Okay? Because what, what I was... I wanted to bring this back to you as a theater maker because it's clear to me, just in, in listening to you, but also having read about you, you did not come to theater as a means to, like, I'm going to sing and dance because it's fun to have a spotlight on me. You have some serious things to say. I love singing and dancing. Don't get me started. Oh, I'll get you started. Would you like to sing us a few bars? No, no. <laughs> uh, well, you always have the opportunity to do that here. But I, I, there is philosophy and politics, and uh, it seems an urge to use th theater to change the world that I think we don't see quite as often as maybe we should or... Um, yeah, but if that sounds slightly dry when you mention philosophy or politics or changing the world, the whole point about this piece, I hope you agree, is it's not dry, it's wet. So, in other words, it <laughs> well, is... Well, you're, you're, you are you, at one point throwing water bottles around. Yeah, you are, um, you, uh, and I'm covered in blood. Um, but, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, we can talk about but that. But it is, an, what I mean by wet is an experience. I know. It's a feeling experience. So, as it were, the political or the uh, environmental questions are... Um, they are felt... They're not just kind of dry things that you're trying. It's not, oh, like, it's not like a message. And that's, and that's the thing about theater is you've got to somehow find the way in which you can speak to people with your themes, obviously through a dramatic story, but in a way they're so engaged that it becomes part of the feeling of uh, the, the, the emotion, the emotional power, the emotional dramatic power which is there on stage. So um, I think what happens, I hope you agree that what happens in this piece is that people are, they're, they're in his position and so they're very frightened and then they're moved and then it's hilarious and then it's strange. So they go through the journey. It's not just a journey of um, uh, the guy in the Amazon. It's an inner journey too. Absolutely. I mean, journey is definitely the word that I was going to use. I think it's a little cliche to be like, oh, this show took me on a journey. But I feel not only like I took an actual journey to the Amazon rainforest, but I felt like I have a better understanding of what it means to listen and the, and the intersection between technology and storytelling and, and really about the idea of questioning abject reality. Uh, and I... This show is so hard to describe, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have you here. In some ways, I feel like the more we talk about it, the more confusing it seems. But I hope that that will actually encourage people to come and see it. Because very really simple. experiencing it is the only way. It's very simple. But the effect of the technology is to see things, literally, that are not there. People come out saying, but I saw somebody but there wasn't anybody on stage. People see my daughter, they imagine what he's, uh, she's like. Uh, they ask, is the back wall moving? Do, do you have things that make it move? No, it's not moving, but it is a kind of illusion. We had Teller of Penn and Teller come the other night, and he said, this is, this is real magic, because I'm starting to see all these different things that are literally not there. So that... Um, the point about the technology is it enables you to do this. It's an imaginative tool rather than a technology uh, um, uh, uh, manipulating me. We're using the technology to get into an imaginative space. That but reminds also, me of how you, what you say at the beginning of the show. You say, am I telling the story or is the story telling me? Well, I mean, that's, that's a very important idea because we all go out and we tell each other stories. But where are those stories coming from? Are they really, is it really us who are telling them, or are we just repeating things that other people have told us? And this is a, an, an incredibly important question. 
And if there are other things, basically, if, they, if the story is telling us, is that the story that you want to be part of? Mm -hmm. you know? uh, uh, so um, these are absolutely critical questions in terms of where are we going in the future? What are we going to do? You know, how are we going to take responsibility for this world? Well, let's talk about um, the theater company that you founded. Do you pronounce it complicity? I yeah. feel like I should be saying it with a French accent or something. Complicité, yeah, you can say it like that. But it's, uh, uh, now it's complicity or it's complicité, it's whatever you like, you know. And you founded this theater company quite a long time ago. You've uh, directed mostly, um, including a couple of productions that have come to Broadway. You worked yeah. with uh, Kate 30 Holmes years ago. and All My Sons and The Chairs in 1997. Um, and the theater company has some other productions going on around the world right now, right? It's got a musical in the, in the National Theater in London. Yeah, we've got a few other things going. Are you able to be involved as, are you the artistic director? I'm the artistic thing? director, and that's correct. And are you able to have any input in those other productions while you're doing this show here? On well, Broadway? yeah, I'm, you know, I'm plugged in. And uh -huh. so I'm constantly communicating with my company wherever I am in the world. But I mean, it's an amazing project because it allows me, I took a vow when I started acting, I said I never want to be out of work. And as a consequence of having my own company, I never am. Uh -huh. um, but it is, uh, you know, I'm a, I guess I'm, I call myself a theater maker. Uh, but, you know, really, I'm just an actor who wants to play and who wants to not stop making things ever. I think it's important that we acknowledge the fact that even though you are the only human being that steps foot onto the stage, that this isn't really a traditional one-man show. No. The sound designers are so present, and I can't even imagine, I actually got to speak to your stage manager after the show the other night and congratulate him, because I can't even imagine the number of calls that he has to uh, initiate during the show. The sound cues, it's almost like listening to a dance. It, there's such a visual element of this collaboration, and I can tell how you and the, um, the people running the audio cues are anticipating each other and... Well, the sound operators for me are like musicians. Uh, there's about, I don't know, uh, nine different people who work on the sound. So there's a guy who just, or uh, it was originally a woman, but she's had to go back to England because she's having a baby. Uh, she was just operating the microphones, okay. So she is um, uh, operating those in terms of, because I have about six or seven different microphones and she's going from one to the other, pitching my voice up and down. And on the other side, you've got somebody play, doing playback and music and also another kind of uh, um, morphing of the sound that you hear. So they are like musicians. The piece is very much like a kind of piece of jazz. They're not following the script, they're following me. Right. Because I might do something different. I'm constantly improvising and developing. And it has, yeah, I would say it's a piece that is also, because I am very profoundly influenced by music, it has a whole kind of musical quality in terms of the way that I make it in terms of what people hear. I feel like we could talk for hours. I would love to get into like the politics of the Mayaruna people and anthropology yeah. and all that stuff. Unfortunately, we have a limited amount of time, but I do want to just encourage everyone to, to go and see the show. And we do have time for a couple of questions from the audience. Fantastic. Hi, Simon. Um, I just wanted to get connected with you. After what you said, I was hooked after the first sentence. And given there's no answers, I don't really know what to ask you, but... Uh, I mean, did you get any answers? Did it bring you a sense of peace, or did it just open up the whole next sphere of what there is to know about the world? Ah, well, that's just a little little question there. Um, uh, no, no, that's great. Um, I think when you're making a piece like this, or any piece, what is interesting for me is not that you're giving people answers, but that you're opening up possibilities. So what I would like the audience to do is to come away not thinking that they know what I've tried to tell them, but these questions that I've thrown up about what do we think is real, um, uh, what is our relationship with the environment, what is our relationship in particular with uncontacted people. Because remember, even today, at this, in this particular part of the Amazon, there are about 50 uncontacted tribal people still, 2016. 
and they have rights too. Uh, and that's a very, very key uh, thought because you've got people who are thinking about the world in an utterly different way to the way that we're thinking about the world, who are not plugged in in the way that we, but who are really seeing um, the world in a very kind of close up with their own, their own sense of what constitutes reality. And this is absolutely key. So I want people to come away with these questions in their mind and also feeling, do you know what? Um, I want to think about this. I want to let it digest. And, and maybe I'm stimulated to inquire a little bit more about uh, uh, the ideas that are in this piece. But it's, it's, an, it's, not, a, it's not a lesson. It's a, uh, um, it's a provocation. It's like a piece of music which stays with you and will echo with you for, for, for I hope, some time afterwards it seemed to. Oh my gosh, anyway. I'm obsessed. There is one question about the Mayaruna that I want to ask you, um, or about the philosophy of these uncontacted tribes. Uh, there is this idea that we need to just like leave them alone, to let them have their rights to be uncontacted. Yeah. But at the end of the show, uh, sometimes, not all the time, you, t at Curtain Call, tell the audience, these people exist, and I went and I spent time with them, and they asked me to make sure that we all know that they are real. Two years ago, in 2014, I was in with a, um, a community of Mayaruna, deep in the Amazon, uh, not the same people that McIntyre was with, but they are acculturated. They're a very successful community, about 600 of them. Uh, they live by hunting, but also farming manioc. Um, and when I arrived, the headman, whose name is Lorival, gives you the traditional speech of welcome, and it takes about an hour, and you can tell that he's moving towards a question, just one question after an hour, which was, why are you here? A fair enough question. So then I told him the whole of this story, which is what I'm telling on Broadway, uh, and then he listened for about an hour, hour and a half. And then he said, we are very moved by your story. We want you to tell it, please, in your theater, because I sort of wanted to know whether he thought it was a good thing to tell. And um, he said, but when you go and tell this story to your people, that's you, uh, when you tell it to your people, you will also tell them, please, that we, the Mayaruna, exist. Uh, we are here too. And in a sense, that is the message for any marginalized people on the planet. Uh, there are people who live on the right of the edges of our world who perhaps know more about our world than we know about it right here in New York. And again, it's a question of actually respecting that and listening to them. Wow, I have goosebumps just listening to you say these things, and I think I'm going to have to come see The Encounter for a third time. I hope you'll have me. Um, do we have another question from the audience? Hey, Simon, do you think your daughter will go into show business? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. She's there at the back. Um, uh, I hope not. No. What? Why? Um, no, 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 no. I, 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 you know, the thing is, I had, a, I had an acting teacher when I was a, um, a student who used to say, if... If an actor can't remember what it's like to play as a child, then they shouldn't be an actor. And so, um, you know, what I hope is that the imaginative power of play that she has now in her life will stay with her all her life, because that is the source of all our creativity, is that moment in childhood when we can see everything. And we just simply play with it quite naturally. Everything becomes part of the world. If you like, what I do on the stage here is very much inspired by the way my kids play. So that if I have a little piece of a crisp packet, which becomes the sound of a fire, that's kind of what they do. They use anything. I mean, it's it's all detritus, if you like. I play on, on, on the stage in Broadway. It's a rubbish heap. It's a rubbish heap of, of modern garbage. And that's the point. With this heap of garbage, we are creating the most biodiverse place on the planet. And that's the key in terms of that image. I want people to think about what is our world? What is the stuff of our world? And how can we actually look through it and understand that uh, 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 you know we can see something else.
I'm so overwhelmed with admiration for you and for this piece. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up, but Simon, thank you for creating this and dedicating all the years you did to make it so multi-layered and textured, and I just can't say enough great things about the encounter, and it's been an honor to have you here today. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody.